Hey guys, how's it going? I'm back here with another video and today I want to welcome you to my comprehensive guide on mastering one of the most important and useful React tools out there. And of course, I'm talking about the Chrome extension called React DevTools. And whether you are a budding developer or a seasoned pro, understanding how to leverage React DevTools will significantly enhance your development workflow. Today, we're not only going to uh, explore why it's an essential tool, but also I'm going to show you guys uh, how to use it and give you some examples on when it will be really useful. So before we get into the video, uh, a lot of you guys watching this video are actually not subscribed a significant amount aren't. So uh, I would so if you're interested in seeing more react and web dev videos, from me, I would like to ask you to just leave a like and subscribe because it will help me massively it will help push my videos to more people. And I will be eternally grateful. Uh, so with that in mind, let's get into the video. So right off the bat, uh, react dev tool is not just uh, another extension. It is actually a debugging powerhouse that can help you solve issues and bugs in significantly less time than you would if you didn't use it. In its core, React DevTools allows you to inspect the React component hierarchy directly from your browser, offering a live view of the component tree together with props, states, uh, contexts, uh, hooks, whatever you might want to see and understand of your project in real time, you can do it with React DevTools. So you could imagine that being able to see this, this kind of information in real time as you use a website and also interact with it is a really valuable tool. So before we start using the extension, we actually need to install it. So I'm going to leave the link for this in the description if you're interested in going for it. Uh, I'm installing it obviously for Chrome because that's what I use. And it's what I recommend to use if you're uh, coding. Uh, but they also do have versions for Firefox and Microsoft Edge. They don't have it for Safari, I believe, uh, which uh, it's pretty bad. I wish they did because I do use Safari sometimes. Uh, but uh, in order to install this for Chrome, you can see that this is a pretty, pretty famous uh, extension. It's been used by over 4 million users. Uh, and it has a 4.0 rating. You can check out all the stuff uh, about it, all the versions, all everything. But basically, all you have to do is just click on the Add to Chrome button. And this will appear. Uh, it will say, do you want to add to Chrome? You add extension. And just like that, it should have installed. Now, uh, all you need to do to use the extension is go to any website using React. So this actually also works on public websites. It doesn't have to be uh, your only the website you're creating. Uh, but the example we're going to use is for a website that I've used in a that I showed you guys how to build in a previous video. Um, so let's open it up. So as you can see, I just opened up over here this website. Uh, again, if you want to check out the video for this, you can go ahead. But uh, just a simple react website where you can watch and rate TV shows. Um, and yeah, that's that's basically the gist of it. But in order to access react DevTools, you click on your extensions icon over here, and you should see the option react DevTools. Now, one thing that sometimes happened is it doesn't recognize that this website was used with was made with react. So in this case, for example, it's saying that uh, this page is using the development built of react, note that the development build is not suitable for production. So in order to access uh, the react DevTools, you just click on the extension icon over here, and you should see react DevTools over here. Now, clicking on it will do nothing, it will basically tell you that you should, uh, in order to access it, you actually have to inspect element. And that's what we can do. I'm going to click on inspect over here. And you'll see that if we click on this, there should be two new tabs, one called components and one called provider. Uh, if they don't appear either wait a bit because it does take a bit of time to load or just refresh the page for react DevTools to recognize that this is a react website. Now let's go over what each of them mean. So I'm going to first open the components tab. Uh, and this one over here is as the name explains, it basically gives you the component tree of your application. So you can see all of the different components you have. And not only that, but you can also click on one of the components like this one, and see uh, stuff like uh, props, children, uh, let me see, uh, yeah, the props, uh, hooks that might affect it. Um, if I click on the provider over here at the top, 
we can see a bunch of the values of those providers, also the children, as you can see, we can click on the query client provider, uh, which comes from a uh, react query. And uh, in this project specifically, I don't have anything major be going on. So uh, there's not a lot to see. But you can see that you can just go clicking on stuff and see exactly what are the props that are being described. But one thing that is really cool is, you know how in normal inspect element, you can click on the elements tab over here and you can uh, click on this and hover over an element that you wanna see the HTML for. Uh, you can do the same thing with the components. Uh, instead of using this, you use this and you can find what component is, is being rendered in the element you're hovering over. So for example, this one over here, I can hover over this and see this is an image, but it's also inside of a card uh, that has a card group. And inside of this, there's like a bunch of stuff. Now, for example, if I wanted to change some prop, right? Some prop of an element uh, of a component, uh, I can really easily do that in real time. This one, this component over here, card header, just displays this, but it also gets a prop uh, called content. So if I were to change this to, uh, I don't know, uh, Breaking Bad. Uh, this is actually not even a, a TV show, but if I change it to Breaking Bad, we can see that we're changing the props of the components in real time, which is amazing for debugging. Now you can imagine how this can be really useful for debugging because uh, if you think about it, uh, a lot of situations, in this case specifically, uh, I am actually getting this data for this stuff directly from a uh, API request. So what if, for example, some data is malformed or some data uh, that I requested doesn't have a specific field. And we see that is displaying null on one of the elements. We can check to see if the prop being rendered is actually the prop that we are trying to pass. It's way easier than uh, going into the component and using a console log to see if the prop is null. Like you can directly see it from here, which is amazing. One thing you can also do is not only just uh, in, like change props, but you can actually change the state of an application. Because like I said, you can edit values in custom hooks and hooks in general with React uh, DevTools. And I'll explain that in a bit. Uh, and the use state hook is a hook, right? So in order to change, for example, I have this simple uh, like counter app over here. You just click on this button and it increments. Uh, the way you change it is you go again to the components tab. You go to this component over here, which has the counter. And you see that not only now it has a, it had the old props uh, tab, but it also has the hooks tab with a state. And you see the value of the state is present over here. But if I wanna change it to, I don't know, 300 or 3000, it will re-render the component just like how it did when we changed the props uh, in order to satisfy that new value. So you can test out how your components will act depending on the state values, uh, which is pretty nice. It's really handy. Uh, there's like um, just seeing exactly what components rendered this component. So seeing all the parents uh, inside of this rendered by tab. Also uh, seeing exactly which file this component is created. This is really useful, especially if you're working in a massive code base in a job or something, and you wanna know exactly where that component exists you can just look over here. But also there's very handy tabs like uh, this one over here, which gives you directly the page and the source uh, of wh where your code is written. Um, let me see what else. Uh, the other ones are not that useful, but you can definitely find use cases for them. But that's pretty much it for the components tab. Now let's take a look at the profiler tab. Now let's get into the profiler tab. This one is probably my favorite one because um, it, it is mostly used in my opinion when you're trying to improve your website, either because you found a, a bug or because something is happening or because you just feel like the website is slow or you just wanna optimize. There's many reasons why you might wanna use the profiler. And I find myself using it because uh, sometimes we think bugs are happening because of the way we structure thing and th things and because we forgot to pass a variable or something more technical when sometimes it happens because our website is in an asynchronous state or we are just overly re-rending stuff and uh, our website or our components are just ve being very slow because we didn't optimize in the important areas. So in order to figure that out, uh, we can use the profiler tab, which is one of the most important uh, tools out there for optimizing your website. So this tab over here is structured as follows. So you have your website, right, as we can see over here, and you have a start profiling but button, which 
what profiling does is it basically records your the what is happening to your website and your components as you use it. So if I were to click this button over here, by just clicking it, as you can see, I can play along with my website, I can switch tabs, I can uh, click on stuff. Obviously, this website is not responsive. So it looks kind of weird, I can click on this, can go back, can do whatever I want. And when I'm done playing around with my website, I can click on stop profiling. What this will do is it will process the data, and it will give us enormous amounts of information uh, that can be really useful. For example, you can see over here at the top, it says uh, how many times our website re rendered, we can navigate through it and see all the different re renders we had. And for each time it re rendered, it will show how long it took for the components now in the website to actually render. Uh, you're looking for the yellow colors over here. Because the yellow colors are the, the components that took a good amount of time to actually render. And you can see that in most of them, uh, it is this component called column display. Uh, column display is actually in this project, um, like each individual, uh, like movie, you can see if I actually open this up, each of the individual movies is displayed by this component called column display. And for some reason, it is taking a good amount of time. But there's a bunch of other components, uh, smaller ones that you can see they took like 0.7 milliseconds, that's really short. Uh, home took 1.5 millisecond, which is pretty bad. Uh, but it is bad, it is not as bad as it looks, because you should also think of it in a relative sense, right? I can look at this and be like, whoa, this took 1.5 milliseconds. And uh, I don't know, the button two component took 0.1. That means that I have to optimize home. But no, home has a lot more stuff than button two, button two is just a button, home includes everything inside of this. Now seeing that a component inside of the home component, it is taking uh, longer than the home component, as you can see with the column display, uh, it seems like that can be a problem. And we could figure that out. We can see in a bunch of them that this also happens, right. And you can see it gathers a bunch of information as well through um, like, uh, the, the, how long it took to render how long the layout effects took to render the passive effects uh, that can help in certain situations. You can also look at this from a different perspective. Uh, I don't like this view at all. I prefer this one. I'm not really sure why you would use this view. But I guess it's more of like to see things from a top to bottom perspective. So like, obviously, our component tree starts with the query client provider, because I passed that in the index file, like the entry point of our app. Uh, and in its smaller sense, you can see that uh, smaller components like labels and um, headers and buttons are all down here. But um, either way, we're gathering nice information. One thing that is often overlooked, and I kind of enjoy is the fact that uh, it also tells you what component caused an update, right? So we can see over here, we have five different re renders, and we can see exactly why they were rendered. Uh, which sometimes can be a confusing thing. You can see on the first one, it was rendered because we we actually started the home page, we fetched some data. So the home component made us re render this page. Then on the second one, uh, same thing, I don't remember what I did, but I probably clicked on Oh, yeah, I clicked on the TV shows tab, which meant that uh, it re rendered again, because it fetched the TV shows. But then I switched tabs to the rated uh, tab over here. So react router Dom actually caused the next re render. So you can see the browser router caused this re render. And you can just uh, go ahead and do play around with it to see. But I understand right now, you might not be getting that much information about how exactly you can help debug your app. Well, I'm going to show you an example that is like, close to what you would experience in real life. But at the same time, it's a fake example that I'm, <laughs> I'm pulling out, right. So this is the code for this specific project. And I am using react query, you don't have to know the library I'm using here to understand what I'm doing. But an example of like optimizing your website to have less re renders and having less fetches and stuff like that is something like this. Uh, you see on this website, you have over here, a bunch of movies, and you can actually rate them, right. And by rating, you actually make a API request uh, to the API I'm using here. So it's a mutation, you're sending the data that you rated, and it will affect the rating of this movie, obviously, in the smallest sense possible, I don't think one rating will affect. But imagine a website which 
uh, making a post request to some data would actually make a difference. Well, you want to see the new version of that data. So you can either fetch the data again. So whenever you make a mutation, you refetch the data, or you can actually change the data in the cache. Now, obviously, changing the data in the cache is uh, more optimized in the sense that you're not making unnecessary requests. But there is uh, drawbacks to it, and I'm not going to get into it. But uh, just to show you how the profiler would detect these two changes, uh, let's actually clear the profile over here. And let's start again by rating, uh, ignore the UI is <laughs> looking ugly, but let's start by rating this, you can see that in our code right now, uh, we are actually uh, using react query. And what this does is it will basically tell us uh, tell react query to fetch the movies again, when a mutation is done. So we will make an extra fetch, which means it will re render the page an extra time, like it will cause more stuff to happen into our components. And we can actually check to see how long they're going to take to respond to that. So let's do that. I'm going to actually refresh this to go from a fresh start, I'm going to click on start profiling, I'm going to click on I'm going to rate this 10, click rate, uh, it was successfully rated and let's stop this. So right off the bat, we can see our column display component, uh, which was affected. Um, it took three milliseconds, then 2.4 milliseconds, 1.6. So it, 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 there's a bunch of yellows there, uh, which is fine. It's not that bad. Yellow just means that it's the <laughs> the actual highest in that specific re render. But we can also see that there were nine re renders in this uh, page. So I came up with an example here to show you guys how it would debug uh, like an error. But this is a fake example. I'm forcefully making a component take a long time to render. Uh, but in this case, uh, this is how it would go. You can see over here in my code, I set up inside of the column display to have this fake delay of 5000 milliseconds, which is five seconds. And um, naturally, it should take longer for the component to render, you'll see there is a five second wait, I'm going to click on reload and start profiling and it will refresh the page, you see it's taking a while to fetch the data, um, then it's going to be done. And I'm going to stop profiling, you can see right off the bat at the end on the last render, which is the one we're going to be displaying this, there's a massive yellow over here. And it literally was committed at 5.1 seconds, which is exactly kind of the delay that we put. If I click over here, you can see the component that is taking forever to load is the column display with a significant increase compared to the other ones. Now, if I saw that I could I would come over here to that component, look for positions and things that um, can cause that in this case, obviously, is this thing I created over here. Uh, <laughs> imagine it's, uh, it's something else. It's like, you're not memoizing your data, you're not uh, using use callback for certain functions, like stuff like that is what actually caused this thing to take longer. And then I will delete this, um, which should represent you fixing your your issue, you'll come back over here, and you'll check to see if that actually worked, we'll refresh this, uh, wait for data to load, finish the loading, press this, you'll see that now, first of all, it only re rendered twice. Uh, but like the column display took only 1.8 milliseconds, which is significantly less than what it was before. Um, I think this is like a simple example, which is also fake, but it's also very indicative of what you can do with this and kind of demonstrates the situations in which you would use a profiler, because I don't think there's a lot of videos in the internet, uh, at least right now, where they really tell you exactly um, when to use the profiler and when not. Now, the last thing I really want to talk about is using React DevTools for more advanced situations like custom hooks inspection and editing values in a, a React context. Um, this can be really useful because I've often found myself uh, needing to do this. I work a lot with GraphQL and GraphQL in itself, if you use something like the Apollo client library, uh, provides a really good state manager for you. Um, and a lot of times, especially when there's stuff like cache updates that should render different components, uh, I find myself having issues because um, I tend to if it doesn't actually re render, I need to see if that data in the context is being updated, stuff like that, right. So I'm going to show you guys how to access and edit data, uh, both a custom hook and a context provider. So first, let's go back to uh, the counter example I gave to you guys this little uh, part of the website where you can just increase uh, account. Um, so I wrote the code over here. 
as you can see. And this code uh, has a count component, as you can see, but it also calls a use counter custom hook that I created. So if I were to open up the, uh, the component tree over here, you should see that not only we see those, um, the count component over here, but we also see the counter hook, the custom one, similar to how we saw the state hook when we were editing a state. Now you can see inside of it, we can also see all the custom, all the hooks that are inside of it as well, like the state. So directly from the component, you can edit a state inside of the hook that is called inside of that component. <laughs> so I can edit this to be 10 and it will obviously change. Now, there's other things you can do to also debug. For example, have you ever heard of the hook use debug value? I have a video, which is my most popular video ever, which is I go over every single uh, React hook that is present in the initial React library. Um, but I never talk about the use debug value because it is very, very niche when you might want to use it. It's literally for debugging purposes. So I'll show you guys an example over here. I can come over here and call the use debug value uh, hook. And inside of a custom hook, for example, I can actually come here and call this hook, come here and call this hook by saying something like use debug value. Now this requires a string, I can directly put over here something like Pedro, right? Just my name. And let's see where we can see this. I'll refresh this over here. And now inside of our uh, react Dev tools tab, inside of the um, component, the count component over here, you should actually not see anything because we did something that isn't correct. Uh, there's no nothing being displayed here, no information being shown to us. And that's because when you call the use debug value, you have to call it in the highest order of your component. So up over here or down here, like, you know, somewhere in there. And you should see now that in our count component over here, it shows the value that we displayed. Now, why is this useful? Um, well, if you have a custom hook with information that, um, for example, you're fetching data, and you want to know a specific piece of information, instead of console logging, you can just use the use debug value. Uh, it's pretty useful for this kind of stuff. Um, it's mainly used for this, uh, like you, you don't see it in the console log. This is just something else I was console logging. Uh, but in my opinion, it is really useful, um, especially if you're dealing with a bunch of components, and you want to keep everything organized. Now, the last thing I wanted to touch upon was just um, working with a uh, context and state managers. Uh, depending on your state manager, most likely you have a provider providing some value. And the good thing about the component tree here in the components tab is that you can actually see the value of that provider directly from here. So if you have, uh, if you're using Redux, or if you're just using the context API, you can directly change data from that value, see how they interact, see what data is being fed to your components, and actually debug using that, which is pretty, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically it. So yeah, that's that's basically it. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below and comment what you want to see next. Stay tuned for next week because I'm going to be posting a video, which is a full uh, tutorial course on React Query, my favorite fetching library. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. Uh, again, thank you for the support. Uh, I just came back from a long break and I'm really excited to post videos. Let me know ideas in the descriptions. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically it. Really hope you guys enjoyed it. And I see you guys next time. Yeah.